This is the Tibetan Plateau, a huge geographic region in the middle of Asia that's more than half the size of the European Union, but with a population of only around 5 million people, which is less than that of Slovakia. This place is extremely remote and empty of people. But it's not the numbers of people here that make it important. Tibet is one of the most strategically important regions of the entire world to control because it is the home of tens of thousands of glaciers locked high up in the mountains that collectively store the third largest reserve of fresh water found anywhere on the planet, only behind the North and South Poles. And at the same time, the sources of many of the world's mightiest rivers begin up here as well, like the Yangtze, Yellow, and Mekong rivers. The three longest rivers located on the Asian continent, and the third, sixth, and twelfth longest rivers in the entire world respectively. The Yangtze and Yellow rivers flow to the east from their sources in Tibet towards the Pacific Ocean entirely within just a single country, the People's Republic of China. Hundreds of millions of Chinese people live downstream within the basins of these two great rivers. And at the end of the Yangtze across the river's delta is an area that alone comprises around 20% of China's entire economic GDP. These rivers are the literal arteries that supply China's huge and thirsty population, and the control of their sources over in Tibet is an imperative matter of national security for Beijing. But then there's that third river, the Mekong, which doesn't entirely run through a single country. Far to the contrary, instead of flowing to the east like the Yangtze and Yellow, the Mekong flows to the south through the territory of China initially, but eventually winds its way through Southeast Asia across multiple other countries like Myanmar, Laos, Thailand, Cambodia, and finally on through the river's delta region in southern Vietnam, where it finally empties into the South China Sea. The key facts that make this 4,500 kilometer long river one of the most important in the world is that it is the primary source source of freshwater for nearly 70 million people across Southeast Asia, while simultaneously providing almost 20% of the entire world's freshwater fish supply, which understandably makes the river critical for the life of the entire region, the same way that the Yangtze and Yellow Rivers are critical for China's civilization. But despite that massive importance, the Mekong River is currently dying for the nations of Southeast Asia and a lot of it can be blamed on the policies of China. When visualizing the Mekong, it's more helpful to see it through the lens of two really separate and distinct areas. There's the lower Mekong Basin in the south that begins near the Laos-China border that encompasses a broad mass of tributary rivers that cover the majority of Laos, Cambodia, and significant amounts of Thailand and Vietnam. So while this southern basin is a large, flowing spread of tons of different rivers and wetlands across five different countries, the separate upper Mekong Basin to the north is almost entirely just within China, where the river is more technically known as the Lan Kang. And it's up here from the high peaks of Tibet down towards the lower elevation of Southeast Asia that the water flows across a much steeper geography than it does further downstream. Think of it almost like a really long, drawn-out waterfall over hundreds of kilometers. This means that the water flows pretty quickly down this area, and that means that the Lan Kang has one major pro and one major con. On the one hand, it means that it's full of pretty intense falls and rapids that historically made it pretty useless for navigation and trade. But on the other hand, in recent times, it means that the Lan Kang section of the river is one of the most ideal locations in the world to construct dams at and harvest hydroelectric power from. With tens of millions of people living so near to the river today, electricity has always been a commodity that's been highly in demand and, as a result, dam building across both the upper and lower basins of the Mekong have been an incredibly popular engineering activity. More than 200 dams in total have been constructed or are planned to be constructed across the southern basin throughout Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, and Vietnam. And while that sounds like a lot, most of them are pretty small in scale and are just located on the Mekong's various tributary rivers that feed into the main section. 
In fact, out of that huge number of 200 dams, only two of them have actually been built across the main section of the Lower Mekong here, the Zayaberi and the Don Sahong, both located within Laos. This means that the flow of water through the Lower Mekong's primary course is generally pretty unrestricted and free-flowing. But this is far, far from the case when compared with the upper, steeper region of the Lan Kang that's more conducive to hydroelectric power generation. Ever since the 1990s, China has gone on an unparalleled building spree of dams across all of their territory, but especially on the Lan Kang, where they've constructed 11 of them just in the past couple of decades alone, with a 12th one under construction right now and a 13th one planned shortly in the future. And unlike the lower basin, all of these dams have been built directly across the river's primary course, and not along any of the tributaries. Even further, two of these 11 dams are classified as large storage dams, meaning that they're extremely large and they hold back a massive volume of water. If you took just these two Chinese dams on the Land King alone and you didn't even include any of the other nine, they store almost as much water as the entirety of the Chesapeake Bay between the U.S. states of Maryland and Virginia, a body of water that spans more than 11,000 square kilometers. That is a lot of water being held back already. But when you consider that China has nine other dams on the Lan Kang, two more being built in the near future, and 11 more planned to be constructed over the next 20 years, you can quickly see how this can start becoming a pretty big problem for the Southeast Asian countries that are further downstream. The existing dams in the lower Mekong Basin today generate about 12,285 megawatts of total power on average, which is a lot, but those 11 Chinese dams on the Lan Kang in the upper basin, where the water flow is faster, generate an astounding 31,605 megawatts of power. When combined, all of these dams on the Mekong generate about 44,000 megawatts of power, which is enough to provide the entire electricity needs of the whole region and is enough to power the entirety of New York City four times over. And while all of this energy is theoretically clean, the big problem is that these dams are coming at an ever-increasing environmental cost, made even worse by the fact that the area around the Mekong River is currently suffering from historically low water levels and drought. Just a couple years ago, Cambodia, one of the countries that's the furthest downstream, had to completely shut down their largest dams due to a crippling lack of water flow, which caused the country to endure months of debilitating electricity blackouts and caused major disruptions across the Cambodian economy. Additionally, due to the lower water levels and pressure coming from upstream, salt water from the South China Sea has been able to intrude into the Mekong River Delta in southern Vietnam devastating Vietnamese farmland and causing fishing stocks in the southern region from there to Cambodia to be depleted by as much as 90%. And while there are other, more natural factors that are contributing to the death of the Mekong, like the recent lower-than-average rainfall, a significant share of the responsibility also falls on Beijing and their management of the upper Mekong and source of the river itself in Tibet. With so many dams constructed along the main path of the river just over the past couple of decades, it's not hard to see that the natural flow of the river has been dramatically clogged up. You see, prior to any of the dam construction here before the 1990s, the natural cycle of the river would have its water levels rise and fall based upon the season. During the wetter months of the monsoon and rainy season between June and October, the Mekong would be extremely full of water and fish, often reaching depths as great as 7 or 8 meters. This flow would be even further compounded by the melting of the Himalayan snow and ice up in the Tibetan plateau near to the river's source, which would sometimes push the water levels even higher and cause the lower Mekong Basin a flood, depositing rich sediments upon the area's fertile floodplains in the process. For context, the Mekong River Delta region in Vietnam produces half of Vietnam's entire rice export and 70% of their fruit and fish export, and is now in a lot of danger for environmental collapse. 
And of course, the natural rhythm of the river that has been in place for thousands of years has now been almost completely interrupted. As the dams were constructed along the river's main path in the north within China, enormous amounts of water began to be held back. Which means that during the wet season, when the communities further downstream were expecting peak water heights, they came up dramatically short. Often as much as 5 meters less of water than what could previously have been regularly counted upon. And at no point was this ever more evident than just three years ago back in 2019, when the Mekong River reached some of its lowest levels ever seen on record. You see, while the Land King in the north, typically throughout most of the year, contributes just a small portion of the water flow further downstream, as little as 15%, it contributes significantly more during the dry season months between November and April, when as much as half of the lower Mekong's water comes from sources within China. With very high snow and ice melt in the Chinese Himalayas that year, more water than ever was held back within the Lan Kang, causing devastating changes in the water levels further downstream, where they peaked at just a few meters in height. In fact, in July of that year, the levels in the lower river got so atypically shallow that the Thai government had to actually mobilize its army in order to conduct relief operations. And then, of course, things got even worse during the later dry season months of that year, when the lower river's water levels are already expected to be depleted naturally. Sometimes, with little warning, the Chinese dams will suddenly just release staggering volumes of water down through their dams on the Lan Kang and towards the lower Mekong flooding communities up to the lower delta in Southeast Asia who are given little or no time at all to fully prepare for the sudden onslaught of water. And then, for state security purposes, Beijing considers its entire nationwide water management strategy a very closely guarded secret, including its management of the Lan Kang. And so, despite many efforts made by the other nations further downstream around the Mekong to work together and manage the river through organizations like the Mekong River Commission, China has thus far declined to ever join. The reality today is that the Lower Mekong Basin is entering its fourth straight year of severe drought. With poorer than average rainfall, the ever-advancing threat of climate change, and a series of massive hydropower dams collectively causing all of these problems for the Asian continent's third largest waterway. The livelihoods of more than 70 million people are at a serious risk of instability or even collapse. Important steps are going to need to be taken by them and China in order to preserve the river, its natural rhythm, and its natural resources. Now, as I mentioned, 20% of the world's supply of freshwater fish that we collectively eat as a species comes from just the Mekong River alone. That is a lot, and if that made you suddenly hungry, you're not alone. If you're anything like me, you typically struggle to decide what to do at dinner time. Should I order expensive takeout, eat unhealthy freezer food, or make a time-consuming home-cooked meal? I struggled with all of these same decisions for years, until I began using HelloFresh, because it's simultaneously healthy, affordable, and fast. Every week, I select all of the meals that I want on their app, and then a box arrives on my doorstep with all of the ingredients needed in exactly the right quantities needed. This instantly cuts out all of your shopping time and the majority of your prep time so that you can just get straight to the most fun part, actually cooking. As an example, I made this incredible buffalo spice chicken in less than 30 minutes. At the same time, HelloFresh is also a much more sustainable choice. Unlike the grocery store, they offset all of their emissions, their packaging is made out of recycled material, and a University of Michigan study found that the pre-portioned ingredients lower food waste by 25% when compared to grocery shopping. All in all, HelloFresh simply makes mealtime better, and that's why I've been personally using them for years now. I'd highly recommend that you try them out as well, which you can do with an insanely good deal when you click the button that's here on screen right now, or go to HelloFresh.com and use the code REALLIFELORE16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 additional surprise gifts. And 3 additional surprise gifts. It's also a great way to help support my channel, and as always, thank you so much for watching.